Hey gamers, did you catch the super secret subtle news that nobody is talking about, about the the reveal of the Xbox Series S? You might have missed it. It's, it's not like it's literally everywhere right now. Who is this even for? Is this for you? Is this the right price? As a product designed for a lower priced way into many of the nicer things next-gen gaming is bringing us, the faster load times and snappier in-game loading, the higher refresh rates, the more seamless game switching and user interfaces, the more modern sharing options, the newly officially revealed Xbox Series S, a product we've known was coming for quite some time now, we just didn't know the official name or price or capabilities of it or anything like that, it seems like it's a pretty well thought out product, actually. And for the people on tighter budgets, for people with lower care factors for the glory of 4K, for example, or even people who may very well be PC Prime gamers but are looking for a simple, tidy, small solution for some living room gaming outside of their core PC game time, I think there's plenty of space for the S in these situations and more. So, are you excited by the value this product represents, or... Are you just curious how this will do in the marketplace? Do you think Sony is going to have a cheaper option as well? If they do, they're better at keeping that secret than most of their other secrets. Hello again, I am Blunty. There's timestamps for several prime talking points I'm going over for this one, so if you're just interested in a few of those things, feel free to skip around, or if you're just listening in one smooth, continuous chunk of classic Blunty opinion and predictions, whatever the case, I'd very much appreciate the YouTube algorithm fighting techniques of liking, subbing, belling, and commenting on your way past. Cheers. So... In the final slide of the official reveal video of the Xbox Series S, there's some things presented that I have a few interesting questions about that we are, in fact, still left without proper answers for. So here's the deal. We'll recap quickly, because I'm sure by now most of you have caught the basics of the news from any number of places, but just in case, let's bump over them real quick. Yesterday, starting with a few leaked stills from what would soon be shown off as the official reveal video, we finally got not only confirmation about the existence, name, pricing, design of the base tier new Xbox hardware, now known to be called the Xbox Series S, and I'll come back to that annoying name later, but we also have our first real look at the performance levels, or targets or options that we can expect. Pricing for the Xbox Series S is 299 Yankee Doodle Dollary Doos, while the big boy Series X we already knew about is now said to be priced at 499 although unlike the Series S price, as far as I know as I record this, the Series X price is yet to be officially confirmed. To frame that in a value perspective, $299 is, a matter of fact, what Mario's overlord asks for the standard model of Nintendo Switch. Of course, the Series S won't have Big Red's very attractive library of exclusive first-party stuff, or of course the ability to go handheld, but of course it will also be significantly more powerful than the Nintendo Switch, so if the target user is someone who mostly plays multi-platform games and does so on big screens, then this represents a very attractive option indeed. Especially combined with the ever more attractive Xbox Game Pass Ultimate service, which did get a shout out in the reveal video of course. And the Series S, which of course is a completely download only vehicle without a physical media drive at all, will likely be heavily pushed as a doorway into this kind of service. From the fanboy side of the argument routine that we always have to dance through, there comes the question of games. And it's of course no secret, blind, drooling, brand, slavishly fanta, tribalism or not, that Sony have focused on bringing several absolutely killer exclusive titles to make their platform, their hardware, worth owning. Ghost of Tsushima and Spider-Man being just two of these titles that for me, almost on their own, justify owning Sony's hardware. While Xbox have for years now been slowly sliding away from that insular, platform-exclusive, closed-off attitude and have been trying to cultivate a more open feeling, at least on the surface. They still want to control things because they're still a monolithic company of evil, as they all are. <laughs> but, but their general plan, the general attitude just seems to be let gamers game where we want a game and not overly lock us down, not make us slave to a singular piece of hardware. Instead, they want us to be a slave to a service platform. To that end, we have the Series S, designed as and will be marketed as the most affordable way into next-gen gaming. 
Another song and dance that always happens around a new console launch. There's always that thing certain gaming and tech YouTubers love to do so much and people on forums like you argue about all the time, especially during the first year or so of a new console generation. And that's how much PC gaming you can get for the same price as a console. Can you match the performance for the same price, the size, the quality, the value? There's no doubt to anyone not blinded by corporate slavehood fanboyism, to anyone with half a clue, PC gaming is just better. It just is. It gives you the absolute most choice, the absolute most freedom, the most flexibility and highest potential for visual presentation and performance. And unlike consoles, you can have both at the same time. You don't have to compromise between visual presentation or performance. There's also no doubt that quite a lot of people simply prefer the simplicity and uncomplicated nature of console gaming. You plug it in, you play your games, you go. And at least historically speaking, everybody on a singular platform gets the game performing at exactly the same way. Although obviously with S and X, that starts to change this generation on consoles, doesn't it? But there's plenty of room for both consoles and PC. They will happily live side by side. And in fact, Microsoft are doing everything they can to make them live side by side as one platform instead of two separated things. But as a primarily PC-based gamer myself these days, as someone who builds their own rigs, even reviews PC hardware, there's also little doubt that matching the Series S's performance with PC hardware as it stands right now for the same price will be an exercise in compromise and hoop jumping, undoubtedly. And that brings us back to that last slide of the video. 1440p at up to 120 frames per second. Much like I said of the Series X when we found out it's promised 4K and 120fps, that kind of stuff, that kind of performance will be limited to only a small handful of visually simple games, of course. It will be on things like platformers, like Will of the Wisps, for example, which we already know has been recently revealed to get an update to let it run at 4K 120fps on Series X. There's no real benefit for a platformer like that to run at those frame rates. It's a stunt. It's a PR move. It's a thing that can tickle off the front of the box so they can point to it and go, hey, look, there's a real game running at 4K at 120 for FPS on the Series X, just like we said it could do. I challenge anybody to convince me that that game actually benefits from running at 120 frames per second. But this kind of performance could also drive titles that matter at high frame rates, like the deliberately simple graphics of certain esports titles and a few multiplayer shooters, where the higher frame rates mean higher responsiveness, which means better performance. Regardless of whether or not the player at the controls can even see the difference between 60 FPS and 120 FPS, which I'm here to tell you, not every gamer can. But I'm also here to tell you, you can certainly feel the difference once you've experienced the two side by side. So while it'll be a long, long way from common, just having the capability to reach for 120 FPS in even a few titles where it matters is going to be a big help and is going to be worthy. Also on the slide is confirmation that this model will also have the DirectX ray tracing. At this performance and price level, it too will be far more limited than the X model will be capable of, but that too is okay. Even on PC, not all games currently using ray tracing, whether or not it be RTX ray tracing or DirectX ray tracing or whatever, uh, not all of them even use all the different kinds of ray tracing techniques that can be employed. Ray tracing isn't one thing. Ray tracing is a suite of all kinds of different things that can be done. Some games only do it for shadows to make them cleaner and sharper and more accurate. Some only for reflections. Some only for certain kinds of lighting and certain conditions in certain places in the game. And I'll bet choosing to use it on this console will mean a sacrifice elsewhere. Like, for example, dropping to 30 FPS instead of 60 FPS so you can have the ray tracing turned on or a drop in the internally rendered resolutions. But much like 120 FPS, it's still a nice option to have there in certain games at certain times, in certain executions of it. It's nice to know that you can do this, even though it will be a little well, crippled compared to the big boys. 4K streaming media is expected at this point. That just means you'll be able to output Netflix or whatnot at 4K if you want. But of 4K, it's that last item that's most interesting and for now, most annoyingly vague. 4K upscaling for games. This could mean a bunch of different stuff. 
My best educated guess on the practicality of this one is it'll slam games into a 1080p native render because 1080p multiplies into 4K evenly. It's a four times upscale as opposed to 1440p, which is not an even upscale to 4K. Whether it's something like what Sony do on the PS4 Pro to fake their 4K using what most people just call checkerboarding, despite not understanding what checkerboarding actually is. I've had many conversations about this. Oh, I use this checkerboarding. And you, oh, can you explain that to me then? <laughs> I have no idea. But it is a clever technique, rather more effective than simply a direct pixel upscaling. So instead of just quadrupling all the pixels to make the pixels bigger, it's, it's clever, it's cleaner. But it is also one that comes with a lot of visual artifacting and flaws especially when it comes to finer detailed stuff. Like for example, hair on characters. It always looks terrible with checkerboarding on PS4 Pro. But the more likely possibility in my mind is it'll be something much smarter and more effective than checkerboarding like Nvidia's machine learning trained DLSS 2.0 techniques. Of course, both the new Xbox machines are running pure AMD chips from CPU to GPU, so it won't actually be DLSS 2.0 because that's a Nvidia technology. But you can be damn sure that AMD are chasing a similar technique. AMD already have a few technologies for cleaner upscaling, like their radian image sharpening techniques, which while were a match or better than the 1.0 flavor of NVIDIA's DLSS is not as good and is not as smart as DLSS 2.0. But I think it's safe to assume that they'll have something smarter than simple upscaling for this, and hopefully it'll be better and cleaner than checkerboarding. But I'm also a little concerned about the tiny amount of storage, just 512 gigabytes, of which maybe up to 100 gigabytes will be gone for system storage anyway. And by today's standards, for a game library, that's minuscule. It's tiny. The absolute, the absolute smallest SSD I would put in any gaming PC I build these days is twice that at one terabyte. And even then, it'll have a separate drive for the operating system itself. So that's one terabyte dedicated to just game storage itself. And with games these days, not only getting bigger and bigger and bigger, Microsoft's own latest title, for example, Microsoft Flight Simulator, swallows up more than a hundred gigabytes all on its own. And that's without taking into account any data caching. And with even an average AAA title these days soaking up between 40 and 80 gigabytes without even thinking about it, 512 just seems way, way too small. Outside of those concerns, I quite like the design. Hopefully that aggressively highlighted cooling vent means a big slow fan with lots of fresh airflow so this thing can stay really quiet under load. And as I mentioned in the opening, as a product designed for an affordable way into many of the nicer things NextGen is bringing us, you know, outside of, you know, 4K stuff, the faster load times, high refresh rates, more seamless game switching and user interfaces and more modern sharing options. It all seems like a pretty well thought out product. And as I said, for people on tighter budgets, people still happy at 1080p, even people who may still very well be PC Prime gamers looking for something to chuck in the living room, there's plenty of room for the S to live, I think. In fact, the only thing I hate about this is the name. Series S and Series X sound way too phonetically similar, even to a native English speaker, and it will inevitably lead to confusion. And for certain YouTubers who are rather more clumsy than I am, for example, with enunciation, perhaps even some comedy. Series S, Series X, Series S, Series X, Series S, Series X, Series S, Series X. Who made that decision? What committee at Microsoft made that decision? What an idiot. Oh well. Thanks for watching. I am Blunty, and I do appreciate each and every one of my patrons floating by up above there, really making a valuable and lovely, kind, generous, glorious, shiny difference to making me feel a little bit better about struggling against YouTube's algorithm. Thanks for watching. I am Blunty, and we'll catch you next time.